Special thanks to our promotional partners at the American Philatelic Society. The APS is the largest stamp collecting organization in the world, supporting collectors of any level worldwide. For more information about membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. Hi, I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And I'm Charles Epting of H.R. Harmer in New York City. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. Now, Charles, today we've got two guests. I feel like this episode is going to be pretty dear to both of our hearts. Um, Absolutely. Uh, so we, we spoke to Marcus Orsi mm-hmm. uh, several months ago in conjunction with the first virtual Stamp X. Yeah. And we enjoyed our brief conversation with Marcus then very much, even though it was kind of just tailored around the show. Uh, and we wanted to have him back on. And I think it was Marcus himself who suggested that we uh, have a have, uh, fourth person join us as well. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, it, it was originally supposed to be two separate interviews, actually. Estelle, their, um, I think I believe their marketing director reached out to us, said we'd love to, we said we'd love to talk to Marcus. She said, we've got this guy, Ricky, that you should talk to as well. He's mentored under Marcus for the past 11 years. And I, I said, you know, why don't, why don't we get them both in together? Um, because this is something that, that, that we feel so passionately about. Absolutely. So today we're going to be talking to both Marcus Orsi and Ricky Vera, who uh, has been mentored and has been uh, working at Feldman under Marcus's uh, uh, tutelage. Yeah. Is that for a, a vocab word? Um, so I'm, I'm really excited because, uh, you know, we, we've both been so fortunate to have people who have uh, helped us with our own personal journeys in the hobby that I think you're right when, when you say this one's going to be very near to us. Um, because we get to hear someone else's story, and we get to—I um, uh, I think it shows how universal this hobby is. That you know, the, the, here's two gentlemen uh, over in Europe who have had a very similar experience to what we've had, and uh, and I'm I'm really excited for this one. Yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. It's uh, I, Marcus was such a great guest the first time we had him on, and I, I really was looking forward to having him back. But the fact that we get to have him back alongside the person that he's been mentoring for the past. Uh, 11 years is is just um it's it's gonna be pretty a pretty exciting in, uh interview i'm looking forward to it a lot i'm excited as well what do, what do you say we get him on yeah absolutely here we go hello gentlemen hi hi well marcus are... it's good to see you again ricky nice to meet you hey, nice to meet you too. how are the two of you doing yeah well i'm in ireland um sort of quarantining and um uh not being able to do anything not being able to travel Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy and working away doing stamp stuff and, um, you know, get, I'm getting involved a lot with the, with the museum. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's good. We, we, we just recently got, um, uh, uh Isabel, mm-hmm. uh, involved. So she's sort of come on and doing a couple of hours. Well, half a day a week with us so oh, perfect there's a bit more impetus um in that so that's that's exciting yeah and then we're working on our june auction so you know lots to do yeah so yeah. to kick things off i'm not sure if you're familiar with richard Fergiolo's website but he runs a message board uh for you mainly us but some european stamp collectors um that that uh you know sometimes touches on very specific postal history subjects and other times it's more general um you know sort of keeping their finger on the pulse of the hobby and there has been a fascinating discussion over the last three or so days coincidentally about mentorship in philately (laughs) and i thought this was a great again the fact that this conversation is going on as we speak i thought was a great way to kick off our conversation here can you guys talk a little bit about uh you know marcus on your side of things you know uh uh, what it's like to have somebody uh, young come into the hobby, what that means uh, to you. And, and Ricky, for you to have somebody like like Marcus and others to study under, uh, sort of what that dynamic is like, you know, how, how both of you, uh, you know, benefit from from this sort of mentorship. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I, I, I think, you know, what's great is I started off young. So I was, um, I was, 16 um when i first started working in a small stamp shop uh in dublin and it was a um a friend of mine who opened the stamp shop about four or five years before that and um in a way it was he mentored me in a way um and 
that that was a, a fantastic experience and that's what I, I guess confirmed in me what I wanted to do in life I I just uh, you know and I thought sort of probably subliminally you know uh, when I met Ricky I kind of thought to myself it'd be great to give another guy a break you know <laughs> and um in that sense because that's what happened I I got a break uh, working for this guy, um, I was just working in the summers and 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 Christmas holidays and stuff like that, and I did it for two or three years. And then, of course, the big break was I wrote uh, a letter to David Feldman, and got an interview with him. Nineteen eighty one. Um, just I was just out of school. Um, in fact, I was on a, a, a Euro Rail trip around Europe with my girlfriend, and I stopped off in Geneva. And that was the rest is history. But it was kind of, you know, this first guy, Gwyn Bennett, is the guy who had the stop, stamp shop. It was him who sort of gave me that first break. And it was and he was very generous in his knowledge and his confidence in me and trust. And it just it just that's it. That's what I want to do. And then, of course, the next stage was, well, that was dream dreamland, you know, going from. <laughs> from this little stamp shop in Dublin to, you know, at the time, one of the up and coming auction houses uh, in the world. So I think for me, yeah, it was, it was when I met Ricky, I didn't really know him. I'd, I'd had a few, few people had said that he was, you know, he was good, but I didn't know him. I mean, our, our interview, when I interviewed him, we were having a cup of tea in, in the cafe in at Stampex. And I, I mean, I, it wasn't like a formal interview where I was like grilling him. I just basically wanted to see if the guy wasn't a complete, you know, idiot, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I mean, I just wanted to just check. And, if he was and, okay. and it seems and like he passed that test. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just said, you said, come to Geneva, I'll pay for your flights. And I was like, oh, okay, what's, what's the home? <laughs> so, so I think for me, it was, it was the ability to say, yeah, I, 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 you know, David gave me a break. My friend Gwyn gave me a break. And if, if I can do the same to somebody, um, I would do the same. So, so yeah. So, I mean, in that sense, and then of course the next step is, is, is then the passing on of knowledge, the, the, um, the desire to want to see that person grow and, and, and learn and discover and enjoy. And, you know, it's what I did. I mean, I, I, I love what I did and um, got, you know, now 40 years of, of, of enjoyment out of it. So what a, what a wonderful thing to be able to give somebody the opportunity to enjoy the hobby um, and as a business and get paid mm. for it. Yeah. So Bye, Ricky. <laughs> well, and, and, and sort of, pick, you know, uh, Ricky, can you get us up to speed on, on your own history with the hobby up until that uh, cup of tea, where, where you're coming from? <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, basically I was a collector. My, my granddad is a collector still. So um, as a teenager, I was basically helping him fill in his gaps in his collection and then got more and more into it myself and then started buying things on, on eBay when it was just kind of getting going and then through uni, I was yeah buying more and more, and then uh, it got to the end, and I realised I didn't really want to continue doing physics, which was what I was doing at uni, and um, I basically applied for work experience at, at Bonhams uh, in London, just which was actually just around the corner from my uni, and um, so I worked there for about two months, and they offered me a job. I thought, well, okay, I'll take it, and then about a month later, they decided to close in the department, mm. so I basically worked. At Bonhams from September to January, I uh, got made redundant and then went to Stampex in February, met with my old colleagues. And then as I was leaving the the, the show, bumped into someone and said, oh, I know this guy, Marcus, I, I, I can introduce you. I said, oh, okay, fine. I hung around. He managed to find him, which is a miracle because if anyone tries to find Marcus at Stampex, they're, they're doing pretty well. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah, and that, was, that was it, basically. Uh, and then... A couple of weeks later, I think I flew flew to Geneva. Spent one night, I think. Just um, I remember he he left me in a room, I think, with some seahorses, and told me to write a little description and say what they were, blah blah blah. And uh, and yeah, that was it. So 
That's yeah. fantastic. I, everybody talks about how important these in-person connections, meeting people with shows. You, you went to Stamp X without knowing that you'd end up with a full-time career as a as a yeah, lot yeah. describer. Yeah. I, I was planning on getting a proper job, but I've ended up with this. So. <laughs> Uh, no, but I love it. I love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah. Been here 11, over eleven years now. Actually, oh so. wow! Yeah. So, how does the process go between the two of you? Do you work together on some things, or sure, uh, sure. Uh, if if anything, you know what I would love, and and you know Ricky and I were doing this uh, all the time, is that. Um, and you know, I haven't been as success as, as successful as I wanted to be, but maybe we'll get there. Um, <laughs> no, is is to is to get get Ricky because he's his his knowledge base is is GB and Commonwealth, mm -hmm. and um, to to really get to to the to the the nub of of what it is to be a, a lot describer is to tackle things that you don't know, and yeah. so. So certain... so day day one, you had me in a little room with a big pile of Olympic memorabilia catalogs going through Olympic <laughs> memorabilia. Uh, <laughs> yes, no, that's true. He's become a, a expert in in Olympic games yeah. and yeah. Olympic memorabilia, which we we've done a lot of. Yeah. So yes, I have to say, well done, Ricky. You're right. <laughs> I have I have you have branched out. Yeah. Um, but I think that I think that's you know that's that's the ultimate is that is where you you you. You push somebody to start to broaden their minds outside of the areas that they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And that was my experience when I first came to David Feldman was I came in as a junior in a perhaps a, a much more at the time a, a bigger organization in the sense because because computers and technology has given us the ability to have less staff. When I joined David Feldman in 1981, the staff was bigger just because the manual side of the business was much more rea the reality of it was much they just needed more people i mean mm -hmm. that's just the way it was so i was much more of a junior and they gave me all the funnies you know indian states and afghanistan and mongolia and all the stuff that nobody else wanted to do so i sort of learned with that 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 stuff but um and that's my that's where i want Ricky to get to, you know, mm -hmm. that's my, if, if I have one um, <laughs> desire is to see Ricky go, go from where he is now and he is doing great work, but go to the next level where I can give him a collection of Colombian States or a collection of whatever it might be. And he, he can say, okay, what do I need to do? I need to get the auction catalog. I need to get the, the reference book. And you, you already do that. I mean, you're good with reference books. He's, he's brilliant on finding things online because that's the way to do it today. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, as you can see behind me, that's my philatelic library. But the reality, Ricky doesn't, you rarely, you use mo a lot of the times you, you're you you're finding things online. Yeah, for quick quick references. I mean, sometimes yeah, it, it's to get older catalogs and things. It's um Better just to go down and say it's the library, but sometimes a modern thing. But all the websites like um, like American stuff, I can use Seagull and their power search is really good. And then there's Interasia and the China stuff. And a lot of these auction houses now have like ours just have really easy to search and find stuff mm. uh, for reference for prices and things like that. So it it's been eleven years. How old were you at that Stamp X show? Uh, twenty four. 24. So, oh, yeah, just after uni, basically like six months after uni. Mm -hmm. Did did you go into the show, Marcus, looking for someone to to hire in the same situation as Ricky, or looking for a lot describer in general, or well, was it just opportunity know, presented itself? Yeah, I, M Michael, Charles, I don't know what your you know your your experience is uh, in in this business, but young people in our business are rare. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, yeah. I, I would say I'm always looking for young people. I mean, you know, right, Ricky? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're always, always looking. If, I mean, if somebody, if I know there's a young guy who's interested, well, I'll say I wouldn't just hire him, but I would, I would <laughs> hire him. Because, well, we have, well, actually, yeah. the, 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 the other news, because how old is, is Gabrielle? 26. Yeah. So we've just hired... A French guy now, he, I think he probably was, he's been with us about a year. 
So oh, wow. he's a, another young guy. 20, 20, he was 25 when he joined us. Uh, a hugely enthusiastic guy. I mm -hmm. mean, really. And it was the same kind of situation. We just thought, well, what, what have we got to lose? A young guy with enthusiasm. So it, it, it's funny how much I relate to this personally, because I was at Monaco Phil in 2015, I guess it was, when Dieter Michelson from uh, Heinrich Kohler saw me, a young person, and they, it, it's the same situation. You're not even necessarily looking for someone, but he saw a young person and thought, we'll take him, yeah. uh, before he'd even really met me, before he'd vetted me. <laughs> so it, I, I, I think you're right that, that auction houses these days are, you know, and, and now um, I say this as uh, still a young person. Now I'm looking for people even younger than myself. <laughs> so yeah. it, uh, Mark, uh, this question is for both of you coming at it from different angles. Marcus, what do you think the most difficult things to teach are uh, in terms of quality and uh, authenticity? A and, and Ricky, what do you think um, – uh, the, the most difficult things to, to learn are that you need the most hands-on because it is one thing to read books and to Google things and to look at images online. But, but for me, when it comes to reperfing and regumming and these things, you really need to handle thousands of stamps and have somebody telling you this is what you need to be looking for. So, so Marcus, what are the things that you think are most important to impart on, on a young person? And, and Ricky, what do you, um, what, what do you think the toughest challenges are to, uh, to learn I, again in terms of, you know, is it overprints? Is it regumming? Is it, uh, what, what, what do you think the, those, um, really key areas are? Well, I mean, it, you know, Ricky and I, we, we, I mean, even though I'm here and, 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 and he's in Geneva, you know, it's, it's a, it's a feeling and, and, and a feeling that you can't really, you can't really teach a feeling but you can, you can, you know, Ricky, you and I, we, we, we look at an item, like, for example, you, you're into overprints. You look at something and there's something about it that's just not quite right. So the issue is, is that it, there is that, that you've got to question everything always. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, you're, you're, you're guilty until you're proven, you know. In other <laughs> words, something's, the thing, if you're suspicious, the thing is wrong. It's fake. Mm -hmm. You now have to prove that it's genuine in your mind. So I think the hardest thing um, to teach is the teach to be suspicious. Being suspicious about something is so important. Um, we, we, I had a very good mentor, um, a guy called David MacDonald. I don't know if you know the name, but he, he's an he's a, uh, Irish uh, auctioneer. He's got a small auction house called MacDonald White based in Dublin. And he was actually, da he was a classic example of Ricky. He started working for David Feldman at the age of 16, 15 or 16. And he's now, in my opinion, I mean, he's a, he's a bit older than me. He's in his early 60s. But in my opinion, um, he's one of the leading uh, stamp experts in the world. And he, he taught me that lesson. That lesson was that you've got to be, you've, you've got, if you, if you're suspicious, then it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And he, he'll just, he, he'll, I'll show him something. He says, no, that's not right. And then immediately he'll then start to dig to find out, you know, is it really? That's number one. Number two, then, then and it comes down to research, is knowing where to find the information that you need to prove that it's genuine because it's not just a smell, you know? I mean, I've been around the great experts like um, Bolafi, the, the, the father, and uh, Diana, uh, uh, Roger Calve in Paris. Um, and some of them just have this sixth sense, but it's not good enough. You've got to have both. You've got to have that sixth sense and then Okay, I've got that sense. Now, do does the literature back it up? Um, is like is something too good to be true? You know, mm. we all dream about finding the 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 unique franking or this like that. I mean, a, a great story um, uh, is is the the ninety cent eighteen sixty nine ninety cent. Mm -hmm. I I don't. Is there is there there is a cover right? There's one cover. Uh, the ice house cover. 
the famous one, which is with uh, Arthur Wu, I think. Is this correct? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm supposed to know that, but yes. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway. So the, so the Ice House cover. Well, that, there is a mythical other cover going to Spain with a 90 cent on it. Now, it's mythical. No one, everyone, people have seen it. They've not seen it, you know. And the reality is it may or may not exist. But the point is, is that if it appears, how do we, how do we, you know, you've got to assume it's fake. Hmm. Sure. You've got to assume it's fake. And then you've got to dig. You've got to dig and you've got to dig and you've got to dig. And I think those are the two things I think are, I think, the hardest things to, to, to teach. Now, obviously, when it comes to valuations, that's another, that's yeah. another big, you know, you've got to understand because there's a lot of great experts out there who don't have any idea of the market. And there's a lot of great marketing people, great dealers who know how to sell stamps, but they know, they know nothing about stamps. It's rare to get somebody who has both understanding of the, of the market and understanding of philately. That's a difficult one. So it's a fantastic answer. That yeah. was, <laughs> that was great. R Ricky, for you, what are the, uh, what, what are the key things you've been trying to pick up on? What do you, um, uh, what do you, uh, you know, what, what are your, your goals moving forward? What do you want to uh, focus on as your career progresses? Um, well, I guess I say it's like it's like Mark says, just to know more. Really, I mean, um, every a lot of people I speak to, they always say, "Oh, you never stop learning when you're dealing with stamps. You always learn something new every day." And um, I mean, there's so much that I don't know. I, I don't know that, but um, uh, yeah, I'm just say just uh, yeah, keep learning, keep playing with stamps, basically. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah. It's almost like the more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, does it, Ricky? Does it help you being a collector? Yeah, it, it, yeah, definitely, because you have that, yeah, that passion for it, and you, yeah, you can spend evenings looking at things on or reading things and reading magazines and you know, things. Although I don't, I don't spend enough time reading proper books or anything, because sometimes, yeah, it's like I say, it's busman's holiday. You can, you can have too much stamps sometimes. So, um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I always find it fascinating when there's history behind stuff and um, even and even not just the stamps as well, actually the people and the dealers and the collectors. It's, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it must be difficult to being a collector as well to kind of draw the line between what you what you're genuinely interested in and what you know you need to learn. So you want to expand the knowledge, but you also want to dive yeah. deeper into what actually being collectors. We're all interested about everything, but there's yeah. always those things that you you know you need to know, but you don't have the passion for that you do with with your specialty. So how do you draw the line there? Yeah. When you go home, do you work on your own collection, or do you work it's, on researching? It's mostly mostly what I collect is what I yeah look into. But then I've got quite reasonably broad area that I collect anyway so it covers a bit of Africa GB mm -hmm. but um and then it's, it's, it's always just like following what what the market what's happening in the market so seeing with the auction houses what they're selling how it's selling so I do I do do that because I, I do feel that's important mm -hmm. um but, so uh, then presumably Ricky here I'm asking him the questions now yeah. presumably <laughs> that, My, Michael and I are going to head out you guys yeah. <laughs> No, but presumably that that's actually a good that's a that's a good uh, model then you can take that same model into work in other words as you as you research your own collection and look for things you can do this you can take that same focus yeah. for for what you're doing at work yeah 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 um i've actually as well just say i'm, I'm a member of the overprinter society and I've just just agreed to be the editor for, for it. Oh wow! So now, <laughs> so that, for better or worse, but we'll see how it's going to go. But yeah, that way you, I'm definitely going to learn more about, about other areas that say so because yeah, it covers um, yeah. yeah a lot more than what I just collect. But, uh, but yeah, so yeah, it's a terrific point, Marcus. Even even researching the in your own specialty for your own passion just adds to the ability that you'd be able to to prepare things at, 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 at for auction. 
Well, and also, and also, I think, you know, so often when we're um, we're dealing with clients, mm -hmm. um, you to get into. I mean, that's it. When you when you're too commercial in the business, in yeah. my opinion, um, you you kind of lose that. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you can't be successful. There are a lot of very successful people in our business who aren't collectors, but I think having that aspect of of being a collector yourself mm -hmm. you then find the empathy <laughs> yeah. when you're dealing with a collector who who you, you you're trying to convince to to sell or to buy or whatever because you're a collector yourself so that's so important to to be i mean it you know that's why i'm so excited for ricky that he's a collector not only is he a collector but he's exhibited you exhibited in monaco right yeah I did yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, well. so you know so that that's so important because you then understand not only the collecting side but also the exhibiting side and you start to understand so you're getting i mean i think one of the sad things and it's beginning to break down now is there was always a divide between the dealer and the collector world you know the the collector world would look at dealers with suspicion <laughs> and you know in some cases probably with good reason but but also we you know as as dealers uh, or people in the business we still have an awful lot to give to collectors an awful lot and the fact that both Ricky and I are collectors I often say to to when I'm talking to them yeah well I'm a collector and then you get into that discussion and then they feel more relaxed because they know they're you know you're not just some guy who's who's mercenary you know. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how it was in, in Europe because I've, I've mainly heard stories about what it was like in New York City. But but when you think back to when you started in the business, uh, Marcus, how ha how have things changed? Because uh, Bill Bergstrom, for example, who uh, is is our main describer here at Harmers, he talks about coming to New York around 1980. And there were dozens of auction houses, uh, most of which would have hired a, an up and coming young describer like himself. Uh, you know, you'd go to multiple auctions per week and there was much more of a, a, a bustling uh, scene around the auction world. Whereas today, again, certainly in the States, but I get the sense in Europe as well, um, you know, it, it, there's there's certainly less auction houses, um, you know, st still a, a good deal of camaraderie. But but how would you compare when you entered the business to when, uh, you know, someone, Michael or myself or Ricky's age entered the business? Well, I, I mean, you know, one can always go, one can always be, you know, like we always have nostalgia for the old days, you know, and everybody does. But the, the business has changed um, dramatically um, since I started. And I think the main, the main thing is that um, dealers, uh, when I started in the business, the, 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 the driving forces in the business were the dealers, not the auctioneers. Hmm. Auctioneers were 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 I wouldn't say peripheral, but they weren't the main driving force of the business. The driving forces were people like the wheels. Uh, in Europe, we had a guy called Mondolfo, um, um, uh, Orlandini. These were the two big Italian dealers. Then you had, uh, well, you had Bolafi as well. And then in in Paris, you would have had the Bears, uh, Pas well, not Pascal, but Bernard, the the, the father of. Uh, George Bear was, was was the original one, um, and you had the big you had um, Rue de Midi in Brussels, you had uh, Rue de Rouge in 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 um, in Paris, you had the Strand in in London. These were all the centers, and you go to those places, and it was booming. I mean, the famous story of of uh, Steve Walski started collecting because he was in Paris and he fell in love with the Paris stamp market. Uh, do you know Skylar Rumsey? Of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. the Skylar the same. He was in in Paris on a holiday with a with a because um, Skylar worked with us. I don't know if you knew that, but Skylar. I, I I that was before my time, but I'd heard yeah, that. Yeah. So Skylar's a very close friend of mine. But anyway, he he was impassioned um, into the into the love of 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 philately by going to the market in Paris. You know. So there was, it was, it was, it was big cities. New York was Nassau Street and so on and so forth. Um, so these were the big centers. And then in the auctions, you know, so, the, so there's the dealers were the drivers. In the auctions, when I first started in 1981, our first auction, 
for a start, it was 10 days. The auction lasted 10 days. <laughs> we had hundreds of people at the auction, hundreds. We would have a banquet with, you know, 80, 100 people at the banquet at the auction. And it was a place dealers would come actually to meet other dealers and collectors to do business and to talk and so on and so forth. So these were big events. They really were. Mm -hmm. So that, for a start, auctioneers today are the dominant force. The major world dealers are gone. They, they don't exist anymore, not in the same way. I mean, there are a few. Pascal has taken over from, from the father. But Bolafi, the, there's a, 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 a young Bolafi who's taken over from his father, but he's not a stamp dealer. Um, so there's, there's, you know, there's, that, that's gone. And then um, the, the, the power of the auction houses, in my opinion, is too great. I, I, I think, I think we, we, miss, we, miss the, we miss the dealer, the power of the dealer. We miss that. And then, of course, are the auctions now, I mean, gosh, if you get 50 people at an auction, right, Ricky? We're <laughs> delighted, you know? I, <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't know about you but I mean, I, to, to us americans that when you know when i when i hear you know what what you guys or kohler or gartner get at an auction it's uh mind-blowing to us because we're lucky if we get three or four people um the bidding is is great the the, the hammer prices are fantastic you know we're not complaining about a lack of customers mm. um I, I i think you know geographically america is a, a much more difficult uh you know somebody in California is not going to come to New York, whereas somebody in France might go to Germany or Switzerland for an auction. So uh, when I, when I hear that 50 is low for you guys, uh, to me, that's just unbelievable. I've never had more than even at a stamp show 20 or 25, I'd say. So it's, it's really different here. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I know I feel very privileged to have lived in all those eras, you know, and of course there are people who are older than me who, who who could tell you even you know a different story but it's it 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 has changed and and of course the internet dealer you never meet hmm. you know you know you don't know who he is i mean he's and there's there's some very 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 successful people making lots of money in the business who you don't eat, you never meet them yeah it was, wasn't <clears throat> the case before because you, you just couldn't do that you'd have to be at the shows you'd have to be out buying You'd, you'd hear for, you'd hear about them somewhere because they'd have to be out sourcing the material. So if, if I can ask you to, to kind of elaborate on that or speculate, why do you think there was a shift in dynamic there from the from the powerhouse dealers to the auction houses? What do you think caused that change? Well, you know, I Actually, I think it's just the fact that they died, <laughs> sadly. Mm. Um, you know, Mondolfo, I don't know if you know the name Mondolfo, but he, he, was, he was sort of the godfather of, of Italian, uh, the Italian um, stamp business. And, you know, when he died, it was, a, it was, a, it was the end of an era. So I, th I, think that's, I think that the fact is that, you know, do you know Ted Proud? Did you know Ted Proud? No. So he was he was a, 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 a major stamp dealer in the, in the UK. Wrote hundreds of books. I mean, literally hundreds of books on postal history of all over the world. Right, Ricky? Yeah. Mostly British. Mostly the mostly British, British Empire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these guys w were the sort of the they were the the stalwarts of the business. And when they disappeared, and they had such knowledge and and. and they didn't, to be honest with you, we're talking about mentoring. They, there wasn't another generation of <laughs> them. They didn't, they, did, yeah. they didn't mentor, actually. <laughs> There's yeah. the answer. Yeah. They didn't mentor, really. And when they're gone, they're gone. And there wasn't a, a, a replacement of them. Uh, it just meant that the other guy who was his, you know, his, um, you know, if there were two major dealers in Italy, now there's just the one. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I think that's it. I, I, I think it just slowly but surely um, they they disappeared and um, they weren't replaced partly partly because I think I don't know. I think the the interest perhaps in stamps wasn't as as 
as big? I don't know. I, I, I can't actually, I can't really answer that question. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I haven't really thought about it in, in, in a deep way. I just think people, it disappeared because people, people died and nobody replaced them. Yeah. It kind of speaks to the, the, the importance of, of what's being, ha what's, what's happening here with, with you and Ricky and uh, the new guy, Gabriel. Yeah. Uh, you know, mentorship is, is so important. And, and there's a big discussion in the States. The, I was going to say, the, these days, I, I think a lot of the concern, at least here, is um, a, a lack of uh, replacement of um, experts at, at the PF and at PSC in these places. Um, I think that's where the European system of expertizing perhaps has a bit of an advantage over the American system, where you have these organizations that oversee individual experts. Because um, it seems like there are quite a few young people who are, you know, affiliated with the um, BPP or A yes. AIEP, AEIP, AIEP. So it, it seems like that's somewhere where where Europe is is um, perhaps a bit ahead of the curve in uh, compared to Americans. Is it, it, because because you talk about dealers and auction houses, and I think that the expert committees are the maybe third yeah. cornerstone of the of the hobby. Well, I think I think the, I think expertise. Um, I don't know what you think, Ricky. I think expertise is. I mean, we're we're constantly. I mean, a lot of people when they buy something, they want a certificate, you know. But the reality is, who who's giving the certificate? I mean, yeah. and Ricky will say, well, "So who should I send it to?" <laughs> right, you, Ricky. Oftentimes, you you saying, and and. There was a time when there were what we would call general world experts, you know, mm. people who knew everything. That's those guys have gone, you know, the, and these were these were the people like uh, Roger Calve or or Enzo Diana. Um, you had, I suppose, Alex Rendon. Would he have been in that? Did you know Alex Rendon? We see his certificates uh, still uh, quite so, often. So you know, I suppose Sergio Sismondo would be in that ilk. You know, uh, Sergio was uh, Peter Holcomb. Did you know Peter Holcomb? So we see his been, certs all the time too. Yeah. So he would be he would have been one of the great all all world experts. But there, but just to say, I mean, look, we were discussing about knowledge and and the, how how difficult it is. Imagine telling, you know, your 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 client base that you you know the whole world in philately. That's <laughs> It's basically impossible, but yeah. but at the same time, coming back to what we said at the very beginning, if you use the basics of, you know, suspecting, mm -hmm. um, knowing where to find out the information, doing your research, I think there could be an opening for more experts. But you need a certain type of guy. A certain he needs to be pr probably a you know a, a, a a nerd nerdy guy who really does he, he, he can focus and they, they exist they exist the trouble is can we make can you make money at it because that's the thing you've got if you want to draw new talent they have to be able to make a living out of it you know that's yeah uh, uh, so expertise is a is a is a big one for the future um because we've got to have that's the so the baseline credibility of our of our of our business Sure. So if I can talk a bit more about the mentoring, how is it working with the, you know, everything's, everybody's so separated right now with the distance between the two of you? How is, how is that working as far as you mentoring Ricky or the new guy, Gabriel? How is the, the process going there in regards to, you know, maybe the same process you're using, if successful, can be used by other uh, auctioneers to mentor people that necessarily aren't in the same country. Well, we no, we speak every day, don't we? And we say so we use we use Zoom and Skype or whatever. And um, so we've always in that already where he's helped me do some nothing on on certain things. But um, I guess the biggest problem is is not having that. Uh, if you yeah you know, say if you suspect something, if it's been repurfed or whatever, you don't have that someone to show. Yeah. You don't really show it through a camera because you need to feel it. You need to like that so that's but, the but then but then ricky for to a certain extent 
it's good to be a little bit on your own because you, yeah, 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 for, you yeah. for you for example you've got 11 years experience now yeah, i'm not worried because i know that you will you will ask the question is it regummed is it is it not and you just have to have the confidence in your own knowledge and your own ability um so yeah i i think i think we're look we're 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 blessed today to have is the technology we have mm -hmm. i mean you know i've done um in fact i'm in the process of, of valuing a, a a 60 volume collection online and i mean yes okay you could say well how can you do that well it's pretty easy actually because yeah. what more would i be doing if i was actually in the person's house i'd just be flicking pages <laughs> You know, and every once in a while, I'm sorry, every once in a while, you take one stamp out and you look at it just to make sure the guy <laughs> thinks you're looking at it. <laughs> but actually, you, you don't have the time. I mean, you've got a 60 volume collection. You yeah. can't you can't look at every stamp, you know, and you so you're just doing that. So. So, yeah, I mean, we are just we're 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 very, very, very fortunate, um, you know, to have. Right, Ricky? I mean, yeah. Yeah. you know, we can actually continue i mean i'm describing here i can you know where i'm connected you know our 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 well like you i'm sure your your, your programs yeah. are all connected together so there's there's no you know there's no um tra the transparency is there so mm -hmm. i mean it's frustrating and the th the reality is we i mean what's it like for you guys can you move around much are you restricted in your movements in the um, US? For uh, for us personally, yeah, we used to travel a lot more that we can't. And now I mean, people just have to ship us collections. And, and that narrows down the amount of collections we can get because we're, us personally, we're volume dealers. So I'd take a 24 foot U-Haul and drive it to Florida, pick up 200 cartons and drive it back. And I'm not going to ask someone to drive or ship 200 cartons to us. And I can't fly there right now and drive it back. So we're limited in that capacity. But yeah. I mean, it's the same. It's the same. It is this. It is the same for all of us. Um, so that's the that's the frustration. And of course, you know, we like you like to have, you know, the social interaction anyway, right, Ricky? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. The Friday, the Friday beer o'clock. Uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. 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 That's why I, what I miss actually the stamp show is the thing that socialising with the dealers. That's something that I've been really able to do over the last year. Yeah, that's well. That's I mean that that's been a, a big a big a big loss for so many so many dealers mm -hmm. is is you know the medium to small dealers not being able to do shows. I mean I don't I have no idea what what the state of the business will be like as far as small to medium dealers whether they'll 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 have been able to. I mean a lot of them are talking about. I know that they were talking that they that. You know the Boston twenty. When is it? Twenty twenty. Twenty six. Twenty six. Twenty six. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, basically, most of the dealers are saying that's it. That's their last show, and so there's a lot. You know, there is a. It's coming back to what we were saying about the change in the business. Mm -hmm. Is there's a lot of those dealers who are all in their sixty. I mean, you go to a show, even a small show. I used to go to. There's a show in Sarasota, and I've been to that show a couple of times, and. You know, you go in there and they're all old old, old guys behind tables. There are a few young guys, but most of them are old guys. Well, 2026, that's it. They're going to be there. So th I think there's another shift coming, uh, definitely. Um, uh, and I, I'm confident that the stamp business will survive, but there's going to be a sh another shift. And what yeah. it's going to look like, I mean, des definitely virtual. You know, of course, you know, you guys are... Are, are part of it, the virtual stamp X and 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 the Museum of Philately and those kinds of right. things. We've got to get we've got to get a new audience, and that is really up to us guys because um, the guys that are older than us are not are just not they just they just don't know they they're just not with it. Um, but it's it is up to us. I mean, I'm at the, the sort of the far end of that, but I mean, I'm still excited about it. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think that the shift that you're talking about will look a lot or almost exactly like what's going on between you and Ricky right now. The mentorship, I think, is is definitely, uh, you know, the the importance for uh, for the future. 
Well, this has been fantastic, Michael. Do you have anything else? Or I, I... Um, no, that, I mean, do you guys are you, do you guys want to talk about any sales you've got coming up, or or do you guys have anything you wanted to mention? Uh, before we um, close? well, we've got a look. We've got a June a June sale coming up where you know, like like a lot of people, it's a it's a it's it's a tough time. But we've yeah. got you know we've got a lineup of our we've got a, a another part of the uh, Egyptian postal history collection that that we've been selling over the last few years, and so that's the second part of that. Uh, we have another major sale of Persia, which is um, you know been been doing pretty well actually. Um, and then we've got a major GB and Commonwealth sale, um, which is uh, going to be probably the backbone of the of the auction. And then, of course, what you were saying about collections, you know, we've we always have we always have France and colonies, which is a, another major part of the sale. But um, you know, the, the the challenge is we can't we can't get out and get the the normal stuff we get. Yeah. And that actually is often, you know, you know what it's like when you pick up a collection. It's an estate lot. They just want to sell it. It's it's easy business, mm -hmm. and that's that's the business that we don't have at the moment, which is um, you the know bread and butter that huh and the bread and butter that you uh, you need in every auction to yeah. yeah I mean you know ultimately you know it's lovely to have the the name sales but the business isn't the name sales it isn't because mm -hmm. ultimately actually. What do collectors want? They want a box of stuff to root through. I mean, that's what it is, you know. Yeah. Uh, they want. They want to. You know. And most collectors want that. They want to. They want to go through a box, or they want to whatever. And 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 whether you're a small time collector or a big time collector, you love to buy a lot, right, Ricky? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. I mean, <laughs> but it's because it's that. Wow, what's inside and all that mystery, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's part of the business. You know, I might I might find a rarity in there, and that's part of. I think that's probably the most important part of our business: that ability to, to create that feeling that there's something inside. Maybe there's nothing, but it doesn't matter. They 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 think there is, and yeah. bang. Absolutely, thrill of the hunt. Well, this has been a lot of fun. We we really appreciate you guys. Uh, yeah, yeah. we yeah. I'm, 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 Thank you. Absolutely, no. and, uh, and 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 hopefully we'll get to thank you in person at a show yeah. sometime. It would be great. Yes. To... Will, well, we, look, will you guys be at um, if Monaco happens? Will you be there? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Ricky, we'll have to get you there this time. Yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> left to, uh, look so, after so, so, so if we don't see you before, we'll see you, God willing, in 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 Monaco. I'm in really December. hoping that happens. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. we, it, would, it would be great for the four of us to grab a drink yeah. or something. Yeah, that'd be Perfect. fantastic. Great Thank guys. you so much, guys. This was All a lot right. of fun. Thanks. We 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 enjoyed it too. Take care. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Thank you guys. Bye bye. Bye. Um, I really enjoyed that one, and and we spoke to Bill Bergstrom a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. and the relationship between Marcus and and Ricky is I, I see so many parallels with with how Bill has uh, has helped me along in my career, and uh, I, I I really connected with that. Uh, with that interview on, on a on a personal level, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I feel the same exact way, you know, with with you with Bill and me with with my father taking me on trips, not only showing me how to break down lots and and assess the value of collections, but how to how to buy material and how to talk to consigners as well. That that kind of experience is is just like Marcus said. It's not something that that you can read in a book. It's that intuition, no, that I, gut feeling. I loved that, that, that conversation about the feel, about yeah. the, the that, that I, I loved. Cause I really, you know, there's so many times where, yeah, you can read, you know, we're both surrounded by, by books and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can read as much as you want, but until you touch this stuff and until it, it speaks to you, I, I try and explain that to people and they think I'm uh, a bit, a bit out there, but, but yeah. this material really, really can talk to you. And it, a lot of times it'll say something's wrong with me and you have to figure out what that is. Or a lot of times something will feel right, but you can't sell something at auction uh, because it feels <laughs> right. Like no, nobody's going to buy your feeling. You need to prove it. You need to have, you know, demonstrable evidence behind that feeling. So I, I think that part of the conversation was, was probably my favorite. Yeah. The entire discussion around mentorship and, and, and bringing 
people into not only just bringing younger people into the hobby, but but the fact that Marcus is out there, like he says, always looking f- to bring new people in and train them. That's exactly what we what we need in this hobby is is people to be trained appropriately. By... I don't know how to break this to you. Yeah. Okay. I'm actually looking to mentor a new co-host of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do a couple of episodes with them so they can sort of, you know, get get on their feet. But mm-hmm. uh, then I'm I'm bowing out and I'm going to let the next generation take over. So uh, I think mentorship. We're getting is a bit really long important. in the tooth ourselves. Yeah. That, I think we've been doing this for for long enough. I think it's time for <laughs> for newcomers. So again, I'm looking for somebody to mentor who can, um, you know, fill my shoes and uh, <laughs> do nothing for this podcast just as well as I do nothing for this podcast. You know, Marcus himself, we could even just just have Marcus do the podcast. Marcus Who's can it? do the interview, and Ricky can be in. It would be great. Again, I, 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 I think our time is up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this has been one of my favorite conversations because it, it, it has been so, you know, near and dear to, to our wives. Absolutely. And absolutely. This, is, this is a topic that is talked about so much, and to see it in action, and it inspires me. I'm always looking. Again, we, you don't have to be uh, – of an older generation to hire someone young and take them under your wing. I don't think mm-hmm. I have that much knowledge to impart, but certainly can, can give somebody an opportunity as can you. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think this is, you know, it, it's better to think about these things when you don't have to rather mm-hmm. than when it's too late. Yeah. I completely agree. So on that dark note, this has been a really fun episode, Michael. Uh, next week we have a really exciting one. Lawrence Block, the author, uh, well known, well regarded outside mm-hmm. of the stamp world, even for his for his novels, uh, but also beloved within the stamp world for the way he ties philately into his writing. So this is yeah. a big one. I know he's excited. He already mentioned us in a newsletter, which is fantastic. So that's amazing to me. So I'm I'm excited for that one. But in the meantime, uh, if you're listening on YouTube, we're on all the podcasting platforms, and if you're listening to our podcast, you can. Check us out on YouTube. Huge thanks to Marcus and Ricky for joining us. We've been uh, planning this one for quite a while, so it was great to connect with them. And, uh, Michael, I'll see you next week on the next episode. All right. right. See you then. Awesome, man. Good talking to you, as always. You too. Bye-bye.